Welcome to the What's New at Delray Books panel. I'm Trisha Narwani, um, Editorial Director of Delray Books. I'll be your moderator today. And thank you so much for spending your Saturday afternoon, your Saturday evening with me and these staggeringly talented, beautiful geniuses on the stage with me. Um, Woo! Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Thank you. So I will introduce you to them briefly, ask a few questions <coughs> to warm up the conversation, and then turn the panel over to you for some Q&A. Pierce Brown is the number one New York Times best-selling <laughs> author. <laughs> of Red Rising, Golden Sun, Morning Star, Iron Gold, and Dark Age, which comes out on July 30th. Adam Christopher is a novelist, comic writer, <laughs> and award-winning editor. The author of, he's also the author of The Burning Dark, The Machine Awakes, and Made to Kill, and co-writer of The Shield for Dark Circle Comics and Stranger Things, Darkness on the Edge of Town. Woo! Woo! Oh. <coughs> Delilah S. Dawson is the author of the New York Times... <laughs> the New York Times bestseller Star Wars Phasma, Hit, Servants of the Storm, The Blood Series, The Creator-Owned Comics, Lady Castle and Sparrowhawk, and The Shadow Series. Paul Kruger is the author of Woo! Yeah. Yeah, Paul. Is the author of Last Call at the Nightshade Lounge and Steel Crow Saga. A lapsed Chicagoan, he may now he may now be found literally herding cats in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck Wendig. Is the New York Times best-selling author of Star Wars Aftermath. Wanderers and the Miriam Black thrillers, the Atlanta Burns books, Zeros, and Invasive. He is also known for his popular blog, Terrible Minds, and books about writing such as Damn Fine Story. <laughs> Timothy Zahn. <laughs> Tim is the author of more than 40 novels, nearly 90 short stories and novellas, and four short fiction collections including his Star Wars novels, with more than four million copies of his books in print. So before we get into the meat of the conversation, I have a little amuse-bouche of a question. <laughs> um, if you had to choose a food or drink pairing to go along with your most recent book, what would you recommend? <laughs> and Paul, you know I had you in mind when I wrote this question. Ah, uh, shucks. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. I'm Paul. Hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. Paul, your three, your three name tags yeah. told them. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's no Delilah. <laughs> um, so, Steel, <laughs> so Steel Crow Saga is um, my examination of 20th century Asian colonialism through the lens of Pokemon. And <laughs> With a hint of Avatar the Last Airbender, you can't leave that part out. It's true. A soupçon of Full Metal Alchemist. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I think, but I chart so much of the character development through the exchange of the Philippine national dish adobo. So I feel mm. like the only way you can properly pair this with anything would be a big steaming bowl of chicken adobo and rice. Where are my Pinoy's at? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Paul also, Paul loves mushrooms. So if you have some mushrooms, bring them to Paul. I fucking hate mushrooms so much. <laughs> I will punch every mushroom in the balls. Kids, you are not good at mushroom anatomy. Mushroom balls? Yeah. All right. Okay. It's going to be that kind of panel. <laughs> Am I going? Is yeah, that, yeah, I yeah, spoke. I, I must go next. Uh, Wanderers is a big book. I mean, like, a, a, I, I, it's a real bison bludgeoner of a book. So uh, it's going to take you a long time to read it. So really just pick, like, a, a simple, easy seven-course dinner. <laughs> and uh, just from start to finish, you'll be there all night. It'll be great. I write for just normal, everyday, average people, people so uh, pizza and Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> Is it me? Okay. Well, I, I don't exist anymore, so who could say? Did you uh, guys hear something? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so for Princess Beard, I mean, if you've read Kill the Farm Boy, you know that there is, there is a feast scene in there. So I'd have to say it's like a, a properly moistened, subtle kimchi medley <laughs> over... Uh, sounds so appetizing. Properly moistened? Yeah, over a soup song. 
of of Orecchiette <laughs> with like a goat haunch with a hoof still attached. <laughs> that you could you know you could pick that up if you needed to. But if it was black spire, I, I would say Endorian tip yip, fried Endorian tip yip, and uh, maybe Oga's obsession from the Cantina and Galaxy's Edge, along with a. Um, they have a bloody rancor drink that like comes with a bone in it, and I'm here for that. So if you go to Galaxy's Edge and you want to eat a bone, I, I hear it's a cookie, but who knows? <laughs> I do eat. You know, uh, for Dark Age, it's a rather stressful book. Um, it's the fifth in the series, so I think it should be you know almost like a Malibu housewife cocktail, which is a Valium with a martini, <laughs> <laughs> and that's also dinner. <laughs> Um, Stranger Things, Darkness on the Edge of Town is Jim Hopper's backstory, so it's going to be quite simple. It's going to be coffee and donuts. <laughs> <laughs> and, yes. and like the weird, like I'm obviously I'm not American, the weird eight, 70s and 80s American like Twinkies and Ding Dongs and <laughs> just, which to me are like completely alien and bizarre, but are clearly what? Hoppers. There's no need to say it so pejorative. <laughs> <laughs> Ding Dongs. Ding Dongs. Yeah. I saw some today and I was like. Didn't he call yeah. it like Chianti? When he was in that Italian yeah, restaurant, in the restaurant. Chianti. Yeah. Chianti. Yeah, nice, like, yeah. That, that netting on the bottle of the Chianti at Olive oh. Garden. And fava beans. <laughs> <laughs> you are crossing the streams, my friend. <laughs> um, so, like a lot of readers, I read books for the characters. Um, in your most recent book, which character was the most challenging to write and which one was the most fun? So, Pierce, you want to take this one? Well, oh, um, crap. Um, pass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'm gonna rehearse. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you make Tim go. <laughs> okay. Uh, the no, I feel like I'm the one hurting cats. <laughs> <laughs> the most challenging probably was uh, assistant director Ronan because he is just so enamored with the power and the skill of director Krennic that uh, he's a. a I, I guess the technical term is toady. Um, and I don't hang around with people like that very much, so I kind of had to invent him on, on, uh, on the spot. Uh, probably one of the most interesting is, well, as always, uh, Eli Vanto is always fun to write. It was great to bring him back. Uh, Wanderers has a whole shotgun blast full of point of view characters, so... Uh, this is tough. There, there's a villain in the book named Ozark Stover, and uh, he's the head of this militia, and as things start to fall apart in the country, as uh, sleepwalkers begin to cross it, uh, we get into you know what he his plan is, and he's not a nice person. So it's very, it's tough getting into his head, um, and challenging to be empathic toward that person. Um, the most fun is there's an aging rock star who is uh, trying to use the sleepwalker flock in the the sort of tremors uh, in the world for his own popularity, uh, Pete Corley. And Pete is one of those characters who he doesn't know what he's going to do next, so I don't know what he's going to do next, and they're just like it's a garage full of cats on fire. Uh, and those are the most fun to write. Um, so all of my characters are kind of blockheads, and I love all my idiot children very much. <laughs> um, in terms of which blockhead was the most difficult, um, there was one character, hi, I'm about to reference characters from a book you can't have possibly read yet. Um, <laughs> there is a character uh, who is a prince uh, who keeps throwing himself into irresponsible situations. And I'm, I'm a discovery writer, so I have no idea why I'm doing these things when I'm doing them. It just kind of seems like the best idea at the time. And I'm terrified of disappointing people, so on I go. And, I'm disappointed. Uh, <laughs> do you mean that? Yeah, you kicked all my names off. I kicked one name off. I'm disappointed. <laughs> um, and I didn't realize until very, very late in the book why he was doing all of the things he was doing. And afterwards, everything made a ton of sense. But because he was so opaque and, uh, and he wouldn't reveal these things about himself on his own, he, he reveals these things under duress, I had no idea what he was doing for half of his chapters. It just seemed like, again, the right thing to do. Uh, my favorite character to write uh, is a crow named Beaky because he's kind <laughs> of a jerk. <laughs> and I like birds. Beaky. Yeah, so in The Princess Beard, my favorite character to write is um, uh, Pissing Victorious the Centaur. 
uh, who is gifted with tea magic. Whenever he gets nervous, he starts like tea squirts out of his fingers and tea cakes appear in his ears. And he, it's like a toxic masculinity problem where he's like, I want to be swole. And then he's like, have a cupcake. <laughs> um, which is super fun because he's like, oh, bro, I'm so sorry. I stepped on you. And like, they're like, that's a nice cupcake. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, plus, you know, it's a centaur that makes macarons with his fingertips. Um, and, and I'd say the hardest character to write was the pirate captain in that book because everything he says has four R's. <laughs> so, every, like, the edits, every time you're like, I found another one where that parrot forgot to say the four R's. So he's like, when, then when he's in a hurry, he has to not say things with R's. So we'd have to figure out how to say, like, you know, fire on that other pirate ship without a single R, and it's really hard. So, so he says fire? Well, he would say, like, shoot the ship. Versus, oh, like, okay. fire, the cannonball. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, then, and then I'm supposed to talk about Black Spire, too, right? I get to go twice. Is that correct? Does I have two books? Yeah. With y'all? Yeah, okay, Black You usually get two nicknames, and Paul's has uh -huh. screwed this up for you. This is my subtle revenge. Um, yeah, so Black Spire, if you're going to read Star Wars, you're going to read Star Wars. My favorite character is uh, the droid. Um, because he's like if Marvin the Paranoid Android in K2 had like a kind of angry suicidal baby who hates people. <laughs> um, and then, then probably the hardest to write would be um, Oga, who runs Oga's Cantina, because no one, I'm the first person to write Oga, so no one had ever set her character before, so they were like, guess! <laughs> and I was like, I hope this works. So it was like terrifying to be told by Disney, like, no, you stabbed in the dark and it was wrong. But we got it right, so if you want to know Oga behind Oga's Cantina, you can read this book in here. She talks in Huddies. Um, so Paul, I figured out what I'm going to say now. So Paul mentioned uh, blockheads, right? All your characters are blockheads. Unfortunately, I've written a world where all my characters are <laughs> empirically far more intelligent than I am, uh, <laughs> like uh, by a lot. And I'm also a discovery writer, so I'm just buying the seat of my pants. So I'm like, how do I come up with an elaborate plan when they're so much smarter than I am, but also make it come off like it was actually planned? Uh, so. It, Pairing that up with the big problem, I think a lot of times is expectations for characters. So my, my books are all told uh, first person, uh, narrative, and there's a lot of times uh, a major character, for instance, uh, Mustang, or Virginia in the new book, is uh, has always been a important character and romantic interest to the lead character, whose POV we're seeing her through, and all that is projection. So how does that person differ from his projection of her? You know, does he hold her up on a pedestal? Does he think that she is less capable than she is more capable? And then getting to see inside her head as we do a POV from her, well, then it plays in expectations and it also plays on how wrong was he about certain things. So it's a juxtaposition of the, you know, the projection of love and also social dynamics onto an individual while then also saying, who is she? What, make, what are her insecurities? She's a human, right? So she's smarter than I am, but she also has base human things, which are child trauma or things that uh, quirks she can't get rid of and insecurities that plague her continuously even if she's far smarter than I am and the leader of a society. So I, th I think she's the most fun but also the most challenging because uh, you get to discover new things about your writing and you know I've also never been a woman and she's a woman so it's very interesting to write from a different point of view. Um, it's true. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, Stranger Things, obviously it's I'm writing characters which already exist um, and characters which people love to see on screen. So it's a, it's a challenge um, which is quite different from writing a, you know, an original novel, uh, as most of our panelists probably already know. Um, Hopper was the easiest character to write because David Harbour's performance in the TV show is so strong and he brings so much depth to, to Hopper that as soon as I started writing the book, like I just heard his voice and could see see the character, um, which is good because, like, as a fan myself of Stranger Things, like, or any kind of property, when you pick up a book, you want what it says on the cover. So, like, Stranger Things has to be Stranger Things. Um, the most difficult character was Eleven, who, you know, she's a damaged child who has been through an experience that um, you know no one has ever been through. So to get her voice right in the book was so hard. Um, my editor, Tom, and I were literally going through episodes of Stranger Things, like with every scene that she was in, like counting the syllables of her dialogue to make sure <coughs> that we had the pace and the beats of her performance captured on the page, which is something, like I can say, like Netflix were very keen that we kind of get that right because um, she's obviously like the main character. 
uh, but like challenging, but also satisfying to actually kind of get it right, which is the great thing I like about things like tie in fiction is like when you get it right, it's, it's, really, it's really cool. It really works. So let's talk a little bit about writing process. What is your daily writing practice like? Do you <laughs> have a word count goal? Do you write for a set number of hours a day? Something else? Well, here's the funny thing. Whatever I tell you is going to be like 70% of the case bullshit. Because <laughs> I'll be like, here's my ideal day, and here's what I'll tell you to make me seem like an interesting novelist. <laughs> and then like, what I actually do is stare at the computer screen until like five hours later I work up like, the nerve to you know, blitzkrieg into it. That's mine. <laughs> <laughs> Here's stole my answer. <laughs> I can I, tell you the fake one. It's pretty cool. I want to hear, hear the fake one. You guys want to hear the fake one? Let's hear the yeah. fake one, yeah. So, you know, I think a lot of times it's hard to feel because, you know, I know it's all fiction and it's not necessarily real, but I try to imbue the characters with a sense of life. You know, people say that the, I, I, the characters really speak to me and through me. And it's not <laughs> me writing. I almost feel like I'm discovering, you know, a world. And I'm really just you know, imparting the message. So anyway, to try to get a feel sometimes to light the spark, I'll go into the woods at night. I have this chair, my dad's old chair, leather. <laughs> well, sometimes, sometimes when I was a kid, it'd be like Darth Vader. So he'd be, office chairs like this, and he'd like turn around like. <laughs> Hello, son, you know. But it's like really high. My dad's also like 6'4", so uh, you know, it's like really high. It's almost like something that would be in uh, what, Dark Shadows or something. Uh, so anyway, I hacked the legs off the chair. Uh, to, to, oh, I'm sorry, back to the tone. So I hacked the legs off the chair with my hatchet that was given to me by my Boy Scout master, um, you know, after I got my Eagle Scout badge. But you know, I didn't want to accept it because I thought it was a little vainglorious. When did you start writing literary fiction? Um, huh, what? Oh yeah. <laughs> So I'm also a 50-year-old professor in a uh, New England art school college. <laughs> um, so then I would take it into the woods, and I did this one time, by the way. I would take it into the woods, and I'd put on noise-canceling headphones, and at night I would sit there bathed in the glow of my computer, knowing that everything in the woods can see me, but I can see nothing. <laughs> and it awoke some primal fear inside me, and the words poured onto the page with a sort of immediacy that I'd never had before. And since then, I've done that every night and I've written my novels. That's it. <laughs> that book is coming out in November. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I will jump on this grenade and try to follow. <laughs> because the honest truth is, I wake up, and then I, make some, uh, then I make some breakfast tacos, and then I eat those, and then I open Crunchyroll, and then I watch a couple episodes of Mob Psycho 100, and then I, then I make lunch tacos, and I eat those lunch tacos, and then I watch a couple more episodes of Mob Psycho 100 until it's time to make burritos for dinner. And then, <laughs> then after I do that, I look up, and it's 11.30, and I say, motherfucker! And, <laughs> and I say, well, I can't start now. That would be ridiculous. So I go to bed, and then the next morning I wake up, and I make <laughs> breakfast tacos. <laughs> Very accurate. <laughs> I have such a boring style. Uh, <laughs> I tend to wake up between 5 and 5.30, check email, feed the cat, uh, check some more email, check some websites. Uh, the cat comes by and decides uh, she wants to sit in my lap. Uh, so that means I can't do much work except when I can type with one hand. Uh, eventually she will get up and go to the blanket that's sitting behind my computer because by this time my laptop is heated up enough to be sending warm air that direction so she <laughs> settles herself down there. Uh, my goal is to try to get a thousand to fifteen hundred words a day done between the you know the tacos and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> fifteen hundred tacos a day. It, yeah, it's, it's the, the something sumo diet or something. Exactly. Uh, um, that's it starts, the book starts out slower, four to 500 words a day as I'm developing the voice and the plot threads. By the end of the book, I'm waking up at 4.30, sometimes three, sometimes I'll go to bed at 10.30, wake up at uh, you know 12.30, get up and, and work for the rest of the night. Uh, I typically can do a book in four months or so, or can schedule a book that fast. Um, and that is not nearly as fast as some people do it, and not nearly as slow as other people do it. So I'm kind of middle of the road on that. So 
but the cat is pretty much always there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good memoir name. The cat yeah. is pretty much always there. <laughs> but y y you need that companion. Like, like writing with an animal with you is a totally different experience than without a cat. Because my dog like changed my writing life. <laughs> Yeah, Wait, okay, something else knows I'm alive. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the dog also writes the books, which is good. Um, You'd actually believe it sometimes. I, I, yeah, I, I let my dogs write at least half the book. Um, yeah, Wanders is a book that taught me I don't know how to write books, which is a bad sales pitch, but you're all stuck here. So, um, I uh, used to think that I would have the thing where you'd write 2,000 words a day, and I would get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I would you know, write for two hours, or I would write for 45 minutes and then 15 minutes of staring into the Sauron's eye that is Twitter. Staring contest, Sauron. Um, he, ne he always wins. So, uh, but Wanderers just totally screwed that up. I didn't know what I was doing <laughs> with it. I wrote, sometimes I'd write 1,000 words a day, sometimes I'd write 5,000 words a day. It came in these massive, strange fits and starts, and I didn't, I didn't even outline it like I normally outline it. So uh, I think the, the only lesson there for me was that uh, writers are very good at codifying their process, both for other writers in which we tell them advice, we give advice and tell how you do things, uh, process uh, information. Um, and we expect these sort of truisms about our job and how we get things done. And I think it's valuable not only to um, not uh, teach other writers that all this stuff is automatically true, because we all get to the book however we get to the book, uh, but that's also true for ourselves, and that we sometimes every book demands its own peculiar uh, things, whether it's you know, write every day or write once a week or kill a black goat in the forest under the blood moon. Whatever it is you've got to do to get the book done, that's what you do to get the book d done. Do you find yourself doing a different ritual for each book on accident almost? It like a, out like a blood book. ritual or a li literal actual ritual? Blood ritual sometimes, you yeah. know, but I'm not like just saying blood ritual. Sure, no, I mean, I think you just got to listen to the god in the woods in the dark hole, and whatever the dark hole whispers back to you, you do it. <laughs> So listen to the dark hole. Listen to the dark hole, yeah. Okay. Whatever's in there. There's, sometimes there's eyes. Chuck, after reading uh, Wanderers, I believe. Yeah, that yeah, that's right. how I got yeah. that book. Yeah, I right. listen to the dark hole. I, I just had that Brooklyn Nine-Nine, like, title of your sex tape. Huh? <laughs> 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 yeah. We have memoir titles and sex tapes, so we're good. We're good. Sure. So, um, so the Princess Beard is very different because I co-wrote it with Kevin Hearn of the Iron Druid Chronicles, who's woo, woo, right, woo. best dude on earth. Um, it's super privileged to write with one of my best buddies, who's a really great writer. Um, so it's a very serious, um, esoteric process by which we went to Seattle and got drunk. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we did this at Seattle Comic Con last year, and we went from bar to bar, and at every bar we would have a drink or two and be like, you know what would be really funny? So the princess had a beard, and the parrot said all the R's, and he only had one eye. And you would think that the parrot was the parrot, but the parrot was the captain, and the other guy was just like the guy that dies. And, and everything was a total joke because we'd been drinking our way through Seattle, and we were like scribbling it on napkins, so we got home and had to piece together what everything meant. <laughs> uh, so we look, and we're like, oh, God, what have we done? There was just one line that just said, underlined, temple of womb. <laughs> so there's a temple of womb. Uh, there was another one that said, Hogwarts but fucked up. <laughs> so there's a chapter in The Princess Beard about what if you went to Hogwarts as an adult and they tried to sort you, uh, if you were a lawyer. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's all puns and jokes of me and Kevin making things up. And so uh, we would roughly outline and we created the characters and then he would write a chapter and send it to me and I would like giggle and write comments like, oh my God, this is so funny, you're great, needs more fart jokes. And then I would send it back with my chapter, and he would edit my chapter and say nice things in the comments or else, and then he would send it back. <laughs> <laughs> and so it goes back and forth as we do the different chapters. So by the time we were done, we had a second draft because each one of us had written our chapter and edited the other person's chapter to kind of smooth out everything. Um, so it's like cheating, basically, and it's amazing. So if you get a chance to write a book with Kevin Hearn, <laughs> <laughs> do that. And drink a lot. And also, we send each other pictures of like our dogs, and I send him pictures of my hedgehog and a hat, and it really helps the writing a lot. <laughs> By the way, I just want to acknowledge that there's an adorable dog here, and we should all just be looking at it. This dog just, is doing a great job, yeah. buddy. And what's the dog's name, Pierce? <clears throat> Severo. Yeah, he's cute. <laughs> I'm a super routine. <laughs> oh. Yes, a round of applause for Severo. <laughs> I'm a super routine kind of person that I kind of figured out that I work best when I stick to Monday to Friday, nine to five, like no matter what. Um, I find when I'm writing, I, you know, books, 
I start off writing like about a thousand words a day, two thousand words a day, but there comes a point where you kind of have to break through and kind of work out what the book is and what it's about. And you kind of, for me, I, I ramp up to like five thousand words a day, sometimes more, knowing that like that first draft is going to be just total garbage, complete. You know, I write quickly, and I and the first draft is, is terrible. Knowing that, then I will rewrite it, and the second draft is usually quite <coughs> clean. Um, but it's one of those things like people. You know, writers love giving advice to people, and people love hearing writing advice. And and it's I've done this for so long now. It's like it's something that I've learned in myself about how I write. And every book, and then I get the next book, and it's like, well, what do I do? I have no idea what I'm doing. Every time. Yeah, it's like sit down. Okay, I'll do a thousand, and it just kind of naturally just comes back into the same. Except for Timothy, because he's done forty. Forty. Yeah. Yeah. And do you still feel that way? Who what? what? Uh, Tim, would no. you still feel? Um, we were talking about um, like almost not knowing how to write a book again when you start a new one? Like, oh, how do I do this again? Do you feel that anyway, or have you mastered it at 40 books? Uh, it's about 55 now, by the way. You guys oh. need to... <laughs> Andy Sassy, ladies you, and gentlemen. You, you guys need to, up, you guys need to update yeah. your uh, bio there. Um, yeah, you should mi drop that mic, by the way, right there. Just... No, it's, it's basically once I start... I. I come up with the idea, do an outline, so I start getting the pieces together. Um, I pretty much know where I'm going to start. I, I also know where I'm going to end, so you know, I've got the basics, and at that point, it just as things occur to me that work in the story, I'll fit them in. And that like takes out the stress, because you know where you're beginning and ending. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's like I'm, I know I'm starting in San Diego, ending in Chicago, I think I'm going to start, uh, the outline has me taking the interstates, but as I write and new things occur to me, I'll take a little side trip here and there, but I'm always aiming for Chicago. I'm never going to wind up in Albuquerque. Uh, <laughs> so I know what I'm doing. I know how to foreshadow, how to set things up, uh, because I mean, the discovery writer technique where you figure it out as you go involves way more rewriting than I would want to do, because I'm basically lazy. <laughs> uh, so I, I would rather just know where I'm going. Uh, to start that. I, I should explain to all of you, I'm having real trouble hearing everything up here. I'm getting a lot of rever reverb, so if I seem to be distracted or whatever, it's I'm trying to focus and trying to get more than every fourth word. <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, apologies. Every, every fourth word's probably enough for me. <laughs> In fact, on the point of, like, not knowing what we're doing, this is a kind of weird thing, and it's a, I am kind of fascinated by this mystery, because in my office at home, I have a bookcase on the opposite wall, which I'm facing, which has like copies of my books. And when I'm struggling and I look up and I somehow have written all these books, I don't have any particular memory of writing <laughs> individual books. Yeah. Which and You looked into the dark hole. See, this is, um, <laughs> this is what I'm telling you. But like it sounds- Chuck, how often do you look into this dark hole? Well, at least once a book. I mean, come on. It sounds strange when you say that to people yeah. and they're like, well, what are you talking about? You've written all these books. But like, it's, I have to, tr you, tr you learn to trust yourself that actually some part of your brain knows what it's doing and at some point it will hopefully kick in and take over and until that point you just have to keep typing um, because you have deadlines and people are, other people are depending on what we do and are waiting for things. Um, but it's, it's fascinating. I think there is something to that where there's a, I mean just as you have muscle memory um, but I think you have a kind of an intellectual muscle memory as well and so that's why you know, advice to new writers is always about like, just iterate a lot, write a lot of things, because sometimes you have to get out a lot of very bad words before you start figuring out how to write the really good ones. And you only get to that point of that intellectual muscle memory by just reiterating and reiterating uh, and editing and rewriting and rewriting and editing and then crying a lot, probably. Yeah, but that, and <laughs> Twitter. That, that's such a big part of it because I don't think like the, there's necessarily bad writing when you're writing it. There's just you're figuring out how it doesn't work. Right. Right. You know, and it's it, it takes a while, and I wish I was a little bit more like Tim, you know, figuring it out. But I think you know that really does come with experience, and it comes with that muscle memory, that twenty thousand hours, right? Um, but it, for me, it's a difficulty because if I sit back and plan too much, then I just have uh, this inertia that holds me still, you know, and I'm not figuring out which path to take. Instead, I'm bitching and moaning in my head. Oh, there's so many paths, how many character, like things I can do with my character. But then if you take one, you're like, all right, it either feels right or it doesn't. And when it comes down to it, for me, it's just, does it feel right, vibe. 
Yeah. Well, you know what I didn't know when I started writing was that um, part of my process at some point, usually around forty to 60,000 words, I have a moment that I call the soggy middle where I suddenly go, oh my God, I don't know how to write. This book is awful. I forgot how to write a book. I don't know how to get out of this. And the first time I tried to write a book, I was like, oh God. And now I'm like, oh, that's just part of the process. And it happens every book. And I'll, I'll just be sitting there, my husband will be like, 40,000 words, right? And I'm like, I don't know what to do. And he's like, yeah, it doesn't and like if Yeah, and like if that doesn't happen, you know something is going wrong. Oh, that's when you get the yeah, edit yeah, letter yeah, that's, that's 14 pages. Right. That has to, yeah. So let's go back to the beginning of you guys as writers. What book from your childhood has shaped you the most as a writer? Can I name a series? Yes, you, you, yes, you can. Uh, that series would be Animorphs. Uh, <laughs> yes. Animorphs made me want to be a novelist. It also radicalized me. Uh, <laughs> It, it did to me what Fox News did to my older family members. <laughs> um, no, <laughs> Animorphs uh, was the first time I understood that writing was a job that you could have, the way that my parents had jobs. Uh, because in the back of the book, it says that Kay Applegate lives in Chicago. I was from Chicago. The fact that this book didn't just grow on a tree somewhere, it came from a person who lived in the same city that I did. Um, suddenly I realized that that was a thing that you could do. And then the moment I realized it was a thing you could do, it was the only thing I wanted to do. That's when I started analyzing the way that books were put together instead of just taking it in as the experience. Um, <coughs> that was when I started to appreciate the differences in how certain narrators sounded. And it was with my first awareness of narrative voice. It was uh, my first experience with long form serial storytelling, uh, a thing that I would grow to love more when uh, people started putting anime on TV, um, and they trusted that kids could handle continuity and long-term consequences. Um, and those are the kinds of things that I like to export into my stuff. I always go back to, I always go back to trusting your audience. And Animorphs trusted me when I was all of eight years old to understand uh, how complex and fucked up trying to do the right thing could be. Animorphs. <laughs> Well, now you get in fights on Twitter. Oh, yeah, I fought, I fought one of the co-authors once because he sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so it's taught you that your heroes will disappoint you. I, I think it's like you, when you go back to it, <clears throat> there's a lot of books I loved as a kid and a lot of ones that changed me. Um, you know, like the Iliad was really important for me because it, it, it's kind of the foundation of so many other things and so many other books explore the, th the themes that are... Um, dictated in the Iliad, but uh, to be honest, it goes down to the things that made me have an internal monologue the most, and it's the books where I'm sitting there and I'm wondering what's happening with the characters, where I'm wondering what their lives are doing, what's like in their you know spaceship or their castle or whatever, and I'm not even kidding, it's heir to the empire, um, because I read the Thrawn series so many times as a kid, mm -hmm. and it opened the door for me to the Star Wars EU. And that extended universe was, you know, it allowed me to just continuously project it. There were books coming in all the time, and it was a world I knew, but I kept to constantly rediscover it with old friends. And that's when I, like, didn't know I wanted to be a writer, but I kept to recycle that. And it made it so much more fun to be alone. And, you know, those are the books that, you know, almost made it comfortable to be alone, because I could live with my friends, you know, in my head. Thank you. So um, mine would be kind of a the, the Earth's Children series by Gene Owl, especially Clan of the Cave Bear and Valley of Horses. Um, Clan of the Cave Bear, if you read it, it's a story about a um, Cro-Magnon girl who loses her family and is adopted by Neanderthals and is raised in that way. And it's it's like this, uh, you know, science fiction fantasy about cave people. Um, but she's basically, she is um, a, an abandoned, traumatized child rape victim who grows into a heroine who starts like she she's like the first person to tame horses the first person to adopt a wolf she invents a spear thrower um but then like so you know it starts out with you know it's very kind of serious and you're seeing this survivor character adapting and and you know embracing a different world because in this imagined world like the cro magnons and the neanderthals kind of are, have a very bad relationship um and then valley of horses changes everything um, I don't know if anybody's read it, but it's the kind of book that you're reading in the middle school library being like, I'm reading a very big book and when I'm 13, and suddenly it gets to the first sex scene and you just go, 
<laughs> number one, do my teachers know what this is? Number two, if they see it, will they take it away from me? Because I would like to keep this, please. <laughs> uh, so it was my first time seeing like a strong female heroine who was tough. She was a fighter. She was an inventor. And she was like very in charge of her sexuality and enjoyed it. And I'd never seen that in a book before. I didn't know that women could have orgasms until I read that book. It was kind of life-changing, and it was literature that my mother bought for me at the used bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, as a writer, you start to realize, like, I feel like when I started out, I thought like there were all these, like, you could write science fiction, or you could write fantasy, or you could write, you know, vampires, or you could write romance. And suddenly you're like, oh, I can put all of this in a book. And it was, it was kind of life-changing insofar as, like, there are no rules. If, if the writing is there and the characters are compelling, there's no rules about what you can write. Yeah, I don't have any specific book. Uh, I read science fiction pretty much through childhood, you know, teenage years, adulthood, etc. cetera. Uh, probably the earliest books I remember are the Tom Swift Jr. series. Uh, I read you know, 30 or so of whatever were out at the time when I was growing up. Um, yeah, I, I, I sort of backed into this whole writing thing. Um, I never planned to be a writer. I was aiming for a doctorate in physics, a career in physics. And, <laughs> and then one fateful night in November of 1975, I watched a bad TV show. And I turned it off and I said, I could write better than that. <laughs> and over the next two weeks, I wrote a story which wasn't very good, but it was fun. And all you people who discovered writing or decided you wanted to be writers, I never decided I wanted to be a writer, just kind of backed into the whole thing. <laughs> oh, this is fun. I'll keep going at it, I'll make it a hobby. Maybe when I get my doctorate, I will uh, take a year off from physics and write full time. I've sold two stories. My advisor died of a heart attack. I can't finish this project. Let's try writing full time. And it's working so far. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember what the show was that yeah, drove you it, to this? It, it was a uh, short-lived program called The Invisible Man with David McCallum. Mm. I liked David McCallum. I love him as a ducky. I loved him as Ilya Kuryakin. But you got to give the man something to work with, and they didn't. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, this is such a hard question. Um, I remember the first series that I fell into, and it was the first time that a book, like, took me away. And I was, like, literally on the beach where you're supposed to be doing beach things. And I'm like, shut up, I'm reading. And they're like, kiss, as they came at me. Um, the Pride Dane Chronicles by Lloyd Alexander was such a phenomenal uh, middle grade series. Um, you know, and, but you learn so much from so many of your favorite authors. Uh, the Robin Hobb Assassin's Apprentice series teaches you how to like reach, like stab a character, but then re continue stabbing through a character and stab the audience. She's so good at hurting <laughs> all of us as, she, as we read her. Um, and then obviously, though I'm sure so many of us have read Stephen King's The Stand, um, there was a, uh, a book that came out roughly adjacent to that, um, Swan Song, which is by Robert McCammon. Um, it is uh, uh, 900 massively awesome pages of the uh, nuclear apocalypse, but there's also the devil is maybe there, and there's a girl who can grow plants in, in the wasteland, uh, and it's this apocalyptic grindhouse journey across a destroyed America, and it stuck with me because it was the first time I had read a, a horror novel. Um, it was the f My sister had found it at a, a flea market and put it in my hand, and I was like, I don't know what this is, but it has a cool-looking devil on the cover, and I'm reading it, and uh, it was one of those things where uh, you know, it's terrified me, but in equal measure, I felt like I was gaining control over something. Um, and I uh, understood that horror wasn't just a thing to be scared of, but it was a way of reckoning with fears and contextualizing fears. Uh, and that's when I, I figured it out. I was like, this is maybe a thing I want to do. I grew up reading and watching uh, Doctor Who. Um, <laughs> So, because I'm, I'm from New Zealand originally, and, and growing up in the 80s, because New Zealand was so far away and, and uh, old-fashioned, what was on TV was 70s Doctor Who. Um, but to go with that, it was the Doctor Who books, so people probably know, you know, the target novelizations. Before the days of DVD and VHS, this was how you could relive your favourite TV shows, which you'd never see again, um, kind of at that time. And there's one author in particular, Terence Dix, who wrote whole load of the target novelizations. He also worked on the show as a script editor in the 70s. Um, that was like my foundation as a, as a science fiction fan and 
that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to write books like Terence Sticks. Um, when my first novel came out in 2012, a friend of mine was a friend of Terence Sticks and arranged to have like a lunch with the three of us. So I kind of sat down with my childhood <laughs> writing hero who is like this, you know, he's in his mid-70s now and he's just this kind of curmudgeonly, I worked on Doctor Who and the new stuff is bad and all this kind of stuff. But like completely lovely guy. <laughs> and he said, you know, when I, when uh, kind of he explained, my friend explained why we were doing this and my book was coming out and stuff and he's like, oh yeah, congratulations, you've done it. And it was like the circle was sort of like complete. I had, I could quote some Star Wars but I won't. Um, <laughs> But yeah, but like they were so important to me and mm. like I still have a huge, I'm a huge Doctor Who fan and I, I still look for the like the mint condition, <laughs> first edition uh, Target novels. Awesome. Well, we have some time for some audience Q&A. If you have a question, please line up in the center aisle by the microphone. If there's too many of you, you will have to fight. <laughs> I don't like these, they're conspiring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so my question is for Chuck. Um, within, I think, the last year, you had one of your Twitter stories adapted into the first ever movie. Um, I did, yeah. What, what With Sam that? Sykes. Yeah, Sam Sykes, yeah. yeah. What was that like? And is there another Twitter story that's maybe your favorite that you'd like to see something <laughs> similar happen with? Uh, what was it like? So for those who don't know, uh, uh, another author, friend of mine, Sam Sykes, and I... Uh, during the night of the one of the healthcare votes, where John McCain was like, "I'm doing something," and um, we were kind of distracting each other on Twitter with this story, back and forth about uh, Sam was like, "Hey, I'm a camp counselor," and I was like, "Oh, really? What's happening?" We sort of devolved this story that basically, "Hey, there's a whole bunch, there's a slasher killer here at the camp," and by the way, Sam, are are you sure you're not the killer? And uh, it kind of went viral. And then uh, when things go viral, it's important, apparently. And next thing we know, we had offers to, to option it for film or television, um, which felt very surreal. And it turns out the weirdest thing about that is you don't own your tweets. Uh, Twitter owns your tweets, according to the US government. So it's very hard to option something that technically a massive social media company owns. Um, so there was some finagling around that. But uh, it was, I mean, it was dumb. That's what, if you're asking how it was, it was stupid. No one should option tweets. That shouldn't happen. Uh, we did not, we didn't plan for anything. We didn't expect to get a movie out of it. But it was amazing, too, at the same time. It's such a fun process, and uh, we, we got to be film producers, which, again, that's stupid. We should, no one should have let us be film producers. <laughs> um, but we were, and it's too late now. So that ended up on the Sci-Fi Channel, and now it's on Shudder. And someone the other day shook a Blu-ray at me at one of my book signings, and I was like, there's actually a Blu-ray? I don't have one. That's not, that's not cool. So, but, so you can get it on Blu-ray. I can't, I guess. Hi. Um, this question is for Chuck and Pierce, um, especially about like the Red Rising and the Aftermath series. When you have such a large diverse cast of characters and like you know you probably fall in love with a lot of them your fans have what is it like deciding when and like who some characters should either go away or be killed off or die i have no problem killing a character off uh, yeah obviously um <laughs> what my problem is is when should i shine the spotlight on certain characters in the large cast. Yeah. It's like, how much room should they get on the page? And to be honest, I think that's what I get more people emailing me frustration about, that their favorite character didn't get more screen time, basically. And I think that's harder, because killing them, I, it always feels right. You know, it's, it's a vibe thing. You know, I've killed characters <laughs> off and brought them back. I've half killed characters, and my editor says, no, you have to kill them. And I'm like, but I like them. <laughs> and then they says, that's why you should kill them. And I'm like, you're right. And I only talk like that to my editor. Um, and I think that, it, it just it has to feel right, but it can't be cheap. It can't be shock value. It has to generate um, a shift in the story or at least be a thematic thing for the story. It has to resonate either on a theme level or on a plot level or on a character yeah. level. Three. If it doesn't do that, then you're in violation of the creed you signed with the audience, which is not to fuck with them, just to get a shock. <laughs> you know? um, my process is fairly similar to that. I, um, I look into the dark hole 
and I listen, <laughs> and the dark hole whispers a name of a character, and then I kill that character to satisfy the darkness. Chuck, what does the uh, what does the dark hole sound like? Um, it's different. Sometimes it's a little bit of a hiss. Are you Sometimes. sure that Sam Sykes is not the dark hole? He might, he might be the dark hole, <laughs> and that's okay. Is, is Mike Cole the dark hole? Ball it's a magic eight ball, actually. Okay. I just <laughs> shake it, and then, then it tells me. His name is Mike Cole. <laughs> yeah, it's Mike, yeah, it's Mike Cole. Cole. No, um... You know, I, I, it's weird, but I actually try very hard to not kill characters just because it's usually more interesting and troubling to leave them around. Um, and to, um, if I'm going to hurt them, then I want them to stay <laughs> and, and continue to linger in that pain because um, I'm a monster. So, uh, but when you do it, is it something you're consult? You know, you're considering theme and story and impact. And I, you know, sometimes you do it for like a random happenstance, so it feels uh, sh shock worthy. But for me, I, I think it's more interesting that when that shock comes you then look back and feel like it was earned. And, and that's yeah, the big that's thing the about big stories thing. for me, is earning all of the pieces. I've only done one, one random killing, and this was at one point where I, I needed... <laughs> literally, he has <laughs> literally done this. Oh. Not in a book. Not in a book. Oh, we're talking about books? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, explains the yeah. body yeah. under the table over here. This, this well, is uh, all highly premeditated. Yeah. You're, no one's recording this, right? This uh, is fine. But like, I, I reached a point where I needed to show just the capriciousness of a character and of war itself and just uh, setting up a character, the, the jackal, to be a great villain throughout the series, like to be the big villain. And so I needed him to kill one of the main characters or one of the secondary characters so I took everyone's name except for the main character and put it in a hat uh, oh. yeah no this was really cute when it was for me uh, because I, I did this and I drew out a name uh, and I looked at it and I had a whole plot developed for this guy like love interests and everything I don't plan anything out I'd plan this guy out uh -huh. and I had to kill him and I'm like, I, I put it back in I'm like no one is here no one can see me doing this <laughs> and at this point I had I, it was like my wildest dreams I'd have a book contract so I'm like no one's gonna read it no one's gonna get mad so I kill like the favorite character of everyone in the first yeah. book and uh, I have to live with that to this day. And, uh, but I still have the hat, and ironically, the hat has Deus Ex Machina written on it. <laughs> so it, it's, it's one of those fun things. Yeah. So you have a dark hole, too. It's just a hat. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's just a greasy hole. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Oh. Oh. Too much, oh. sorry. I, oh. I, I forgot. Uh, please be aware, many members of your audience may be under 18. <laughs> Paul, I've been meaning to bring this up to you. Those F-bombs have got to stop. Listen. That dog is clearly under the age of 18. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you would put that filth in their ears. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Good time. Yeah. Good time. Uh. Hello. Um, first off, I want to say props to Paul and Timothy for being uh, cat dads. I am a cat dad myself. My cat, Bacon, will be 20 in September. Wow. Uh, Woo, bacon. <laughs> second, uh, my question is... If you had a character, if you had a character of any of your books that you would call, you know, your best friend, the one that you would have a dinner date with, your ride or die, you know, somebody you'd, you'd call like, you know, like, you know, like uh, they'd be the better call Saul, the better call Saul <laughs> persons. Which character would be from any of your book series, and why? Well, I mean, are you having pizza with them, or hiding a body with them, or both? It can be both in the same time. A date and a body hiding ritual. You, it's your it's your best friend. Well, for me, it's Mr. Bones in Aftermath. He's a he's a lovable. Yeah, there's one guy. He's like, yeah. <laughs> uh, he's a lovable, huggable murder droid, and uh, he will protect me through all things. That's it. No one has any answers. It's yeah. just me. Very complex question. That's tough. Yeah. I, I, I've been talking a lot. Someone else talk. I have a character called uh, Ray Electromatic, who is a robot detective who's actually a robot assassin. Um, he'd be good company, I think. He has a 24-hour memory, so like you could do anything at all, like hide a body, and then the next day he doesn't remember. <laughs> and it starts all over again. Oh, there's a 60-pound fox in mine um, named uh, uh, Sophocles. Um, who has repeatedly been cloned throughout his life. So he's literally uh, this, uh, what, the 18th clone. Um, so 700 years, this one family has had him as their fox. And he's pretty smart, and he just, like, uh, he, he thinks, mad, like, he eats jelly beans. And I want to hang out with that fox. <laughs> I would probably pick Admiral Aralani, because she was back there when Thrawn was still in the unknown regions. She probably knows a lot more about him, and it would be interesting to uh, have a discussion with her. There's a character in Steel Crow Saga uh, whose name is Shulan, and 
Shulan is obsessed with detective fiction because I am obsessed with detective fiction. And she enters the story because she's gotten it into her head that she can go out there and live a big detective story if she really wants to, especially if she can use it to embarrass her sister. <laughs> and I enjoy the idea of somebody using books to aid their pettiness. Uh, that, is, <laughs> that is something that I wrote from a very personal and deep place. <laughs> Also, she has a pet rat, and the rat is cute. I think rats are cute. <laughs> so mine would probably have to be Vi Marathi from Phasma and Black Spire. Um, like, she's, she's deadly, she's a spy, she's charming, she takes no crap, she's a terrible knitter, which makes me feel good about my worst knitting. <laughs> um, but I've literally met her. For real, I'm not making it, like, she's, she could, if you go to Galaxy's Edge at Disneyland, like, Vi exists. So I kind of say, it's like, remember that day on Sesame Street when Big Bird, after years of talking about Snuffleupagus, finally Snuffleupagus showed up? And everybody realized that Big Bird wasn't a paranoid schizophrenic, like, <laughs> Snuffleupagus was real? I've met my Snuffleupagus. And she's really nice. Aww. Look at the good boy. Okay, now I just want to write a corgi with belly rubs, because... Yeah, the that's Corgi getting odd. belly rubs up here. I just you all need to understand that. Thank you for your question. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we have time for one more question. No pressure. Come or anything. on, you can do it. It's got to be good though. It's got to be spectacular. Yeah, the best question you've ever asked anyone in your life. Oh damn it! The corgi deserves a question. The corgi. Let the corgi speak. Let the corgi speak. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, Tim probably has a, a real personal connection to this, but uh, what do you find writing to be more complicated doing? Writing to intellectual property that exists or working from a blank slate and building up from there? They, they both have their advantages. Uh, I like to, I, I liken in somebody else's property like Star Wars to basketball, okay? It is, you've got a court, you've got a number of players, you've got, you've got some fixed parameters and such. Creating my own stuff is much more akin to Calvin Ball. <laughs> you get to kind of make it all up. It has to be cons internally consistent then, but if you want a train that runs between stars at a light year per minute inside giant tubes, you can do that, and I did. Uh, it would not work with Star Wars. So uh, pluses and minuses. It's a very different thing, I think. Um, you know, when you're writing an original novel, in a way it's easy because you can kind of make it up and it's your thing. If you're working with something which has already been created or characters or a setting that belongs somewhere else, you not only have to write an original novel, which is a, like a compelling novel-length narrative, it has to then be true to the property that you're working for uh, with the characters that people know and already love. So that's like two extra jobs on top of what is actually already quite a hard work. It's, but it's like, it's, it's different, it's satisfying, but difficult. Thank you. I, I'm sorry to say that we have to say goodbye. Thank you so much for being in the Thank you, everybody. Audience. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists.